That's a good question. Okay, the first building should be right in front of you there somewhere. So it looks like it's on the opposite side of this little creek. There's the building. Yeah, it's a good size one. So we stopped here at this Cap Martin mine. Now we were headed up to the Monumental and I remembered seeing on the topo map there was another mine down here in a draw called the Cap Martin mine. Originally I thought, I've heard of this mine before and I thought people were saying Camp Martin, not Cap, like a baseball cap. Cap Martin, it was the name of the mine owner way back uh, in the late 1800s. That's really all the history I have on this old mine. Uh, I think it operated, you know, maybe up into the 1910s, 20s maybe. There was just a little bit of work done, uh, a few short adits, so a lot of plastering done around this old mine. But that's really all the history I have on this mine. But I happen to see on the topo map that it had some old buildings and that's what really uh, got my attention. This topo map I was using was way back from the 50s, but it did show some old buildings there. So we decided to stop and uh, look at this mine. And we tried to find a road down into this old mine and there was no roads. So we had to just kind of bush or whack our way down into this old mine. Now I know some of you are wondering who the heck are these people with you? Where'd they come from? Well, have you ever seen uh, the Muppet movie with Kermit the Frog and Fozzie the Bear driving down the road and they run into Gonzo and he winds up in the back seat. We picked up a weirdo. That's right. I picked up a couple weirdos. <sighs> Meet Trevor and Jerry Ann. They're some local folks. Uh, we've been working on the Cornucopia movie project together. Uh, that's where we met. Uh, I think it was last year. Was it last year or the year before? while we were working on the Cornucopia movie. Uh, just so happens that they're as weird as me, this weird interest in these old mines, and uh, we just happened to hit it off. Uh, that We were the almost exact same age as each other. Uh, Trevor and I are just a few days apart in age, and uh, Jerry Ann's not far behind. So we're all about the same age. We like the same interests, same political views, and I really enjoy going out and looking uh, at these old mines with these folks. So uh, you'll probably see them in more videos. I've been inviting them along as I've got time to get out to look at mines. So you'll see them in some more videos coming up as well. So anyway, back to looking at the Cap Martin. I'm not gonna say a lot about this mine because I just don't know much about it. If anybody has any history on this old mine, feel free to leave it in the comments below. And um, back to the video. Wow. So glass in those windows. Ooh, short ceiling. Boy, those insides of these logs are still in really good shape.
egg boxes. Here's where the stove would have went. Well, this building's not long. It's an oldie. What are you thinking? Early 1900s? Yeah, I would say early 1900s. I've never seen one put together like this on the ends, so. though. The logs aren't interlaced. That's really odd. Yeah, it looks like it's completely collapsed in. The small cans. This looks like a sugar tin. Now, here's the other one. Oh, here we go. I think the, uh, the tunnel is below us. Oh, it's got an old fireplace. Gold riveted pipe. What's left of an add it. Pretty large tailing bow here. Until this is an old mine with the way these trees have grown up.
Small tiling pile up there. Waste rock. Wow, well, that's a pretty good sized building. Had a electric wiring going into it. Yep. That's neat with the windows. Keep out you. Well, I think that's me. Somebody's broke the door open. There's that little waste rock pile from earlier. Open? Uh, it's just got a little tiny hole. That big. Yeah, yeah it is. It's shifting. See where that glass is shifted? Where the frame is shifted and the glass is breaking. Okay, so let's talk about this old mine for a minute. Now, the current one of the current claim owners, he's a viewer of the channel. Hi, Robert. Uh, I'm sorry I didn't get out here to look at your mine sooner, but Robert's been on me for several years. Go out and look at this old mine of theirs. And, um, you know, for various circumstances, I just didn't have a chance to get out there till now. And I wish I would have got out there a little sooner and looked at this because this is a really interesting old mine. Uh, the building structures are disappearing fairly quickly. Where you just seen us, that was the lower portal. Evidently, uh, I'm guessing after 1900 sometimes, somebody put in another small mill in this location. Now, this was not uh, the primary mill for the early production. Now, I don't know anything about this secondary mill. There's, I can find zero information out about this little mill. It wasn't very big, um, but some of the buildings in that area uh, were fairly decent sized buildings. But that's really all I know about that part of the mine. Now, this is an old mine. Uh, it was one of the early hard rock mines in this area. It's actually in Grant County, but it's one of the early hard rock mines in the area. It was started in 1870 uh, by three gentlemen, uh, Harvey Robbins, Isaac Nail, and Isaac Klopp uh, started this operation. It sounds like early on they had some really good ore show up on the outcropping up on top of the hill. And this is this picture here is of that outcropping. They sank a about a hundred foot inclined shaft in uh, on that outcropping, and had some really good results uh, on that upper ore. And so they got some investors involved early on, 
and built a, now this part's a little, the information's a little sketchy. It sounds like it wound up as a 20 stamp mill. They originally designed it as a 20 stamp mill, but it sounds like they didn't have enough money at first to get the full 20 stamps. So it started off as a 10 stamp and it, I think later they were able to buy the other 10 stamps and make it a 20 stamp mill. And in about 1939, at least part of this mill, at least 10 stamps of it wound up over at the Red Boy mine. This mine or this uh, mill, I don't think operated a terribly long time. One thing you got to remember about this mine, it's one of the few mines in the area that are, it had more value in the silver rather than the gold. It had about a 20 to 1 silver to gold ratio, which made the silver a little more valuable uh, than the gold in the, the mine. So this particular mill, which we'll get into here in just a little bit, this is a, stay tuned with this. This is a really interesting old mill. Um, it was set up to process silver and gold ore. So it was set up a little different than most of the mills we see around Northeast Oregon. So it, that's, it's a really interesting mill, trust me. I think this mine still probably has quite a bit of potential to it uh, because I think the deeper they got, the, the harder the ore was to work, especially with that early processing methods of just uh, a stamp mill. I think they had a really hard time extracting the valuable ore, the valuable minerals out of the ore uh, with that style of mill for that time period. I think that's one reason it didn't last a terribly long time. Now this thing has over 4,000 feet of workings in it. A couple of reports say up to 6,000, but I think it's probably closer to 4,000. They cross cut into these veins. The first they sank that shaft in a ways, then they started sinking um, cross cuts into the, the hillside, went back in quite a ways and they cut 12 different veins here. They only worked really two of those veins to any amount uh, with some cross or some drifting on those and a little bit of stoping. Uh, and there's a vertical separation from the lowest portal up to the top of about 700 feet. Uh, so the, the two levels are not 100 feet apart. They're several hundred feet apart from each other. And then the upper portal is, I'd say, two to 300 feet uh, from where they found it, the outcropping on the top where they sank the shaft in. These are interconnected through some winzes. The upper shaft is collapsed in now, which we'll get into later. a little later. We'll look at that. The two portals are in actually really pretty good shape. Uh, but... We were not able to get underground. I think the current mine owners would, claimants would probably take us underground if we can meet them up there on a day that uh, they're actually there. I think they'd be more than happy to take us underground. You'll see in a minute, they've got, they've got these sealed off really well. Uh, good job guys on sealing those things off to keep people out and the elements out of there. Did a great job there. With that said, we'll jump back into this mine, start walking around here. We'll look at the uh, the portals, and then we'll look at the, the mill site and then the upper shaft. This thing's in solid granite.
Oh, the road's right below it down there. But look at this uh, thing coming down, and then the water goes down. It's really weird. Bricks up here too. I have no idea. So that trench is a mystery to me. Really? I have no idea what they were doing. What do you call that part in the stamp, you know, the part that rotates and lifts up the stamp and it keeps turning? Cam. This is an early mill. Yes. They didn't use any concrete. All square nails.
Yeah, I don't know why the water would be coming from that way, though. Wow. Size of those timbers. Much has been said and written about the monumental mine of Grant County, and yet there is much more to say. In fact, a history of this great mining enterprise would be more of interest than a romance or a fable. It's not my intention, however, to attempt to write its history. I leave that work for a more able pen than mine. I've been in this country for a period of 17 years, and have had, for the first, a great faith in the mineral resources of the Blue Mountains. But I must say that the developments at the Monumental City exceed my greatest expectations. To have any idea of the amount of work that has been done in prospecting the rich loads of silver on the headwaters of Granite Creek, it would be necessary to visit that locality and see for yourself. It is no small task to bore a hole eight or nine hundred feet into solid granite even with the very best mining machinery. But when we see a tunnel nearly six feet wide by six and a half to seven feet high that has been driven by hand drill and giant powder for a distance of nearly 800 feet into hard rock, and consider that it is the result of nearly two years of labor, we can have some faint idea of the immense labor performed there. After a very pleasant drive of two days, through very fragrant pine forest, and over the beautiful blue mountains situated and lying between the capital city and Granite Creek, we arrive at the headquarters of Mr. S.C. Miller, the superintendent and general manager of the Monumental Mine, where we found Mr. E.J.W. Stem, president of the company. After refreshing ourselves for a time, the hour being yet early, we accepted the invitation of President Stem to walk up and take a look at the fine silver mine the company are erecting for their mine. Arriving at the mill, which is situated on the north side of the mountain ridge, about 200 yards west of the mine, we were surprised to see a building constructed on a steep mountainside, occupying 100 feet north and south, and nearly 150 feet east and west, 
and in a height of nearly 75 feet from the ventilators at the top of the mill to the ground floor of the engine room. We were informed that there was used in the covering of the roof nearly 110,000 shingles. We found that the engine of 80 horsepower with two boilers and all set and ready to fire as nice and as strong as a machinery as one could wish to see. Adjoining the engine room on the same floor is the apartment occupied by the amalgamating pans, four in number and with settlers. While standing inside this room, we could have a good view of nearly all the inside work of the mill. In front on the second floor bench above the pans is the framework for the stamps. The capacity of the mill when complete will be 20 stamps, but for the present only 10 will be used. To the west and on the level of the stamps is the roasting machinery, which is a revolving cylinder of heavy wrought iron, about three and a half feet in diameter and 30 feet long and lined with fire brick. The pulverized ore will be taken from the stamps by elevators and deposited in the roasters, which as it revolves causes the finely padded ore to drop through a flame of fire passing through the cylinder. On your witnessing the revelations of a bolt reel in a flour mill, we'll have an idea of how the quartz passes through the roaster. Above the stamps on the third plat is the dryer, which is a ball shaped revolving cylinder of heavy iron. About 18 feet in length and so constructed that the hot air from the roasting furnace passes through thoroughly drying the ore before being conveyed to the stamps. On the fourth floor and directly above the dryer is the machine for breaking the quartz in order that it may be fed into the stamps by self-acting apparatus. When completed, there will be a tramway from the ore dump at the mine leading to the crushing room of the mill. The ore will be conveyed from the mine to the mill in cars holding 1,000 pounds each. The floor of the crushing room is nearly on level with the top of the mountain ridge fronting the mill. Here and adjoining the mill, the company are erecting their storehouse for supplies and etc. From our standpoint, it was a busy sight to see the millwrights, carpenters, brick masons, and machinists all working and pounding away in their separate capacities, each class seemingly unaware of the presence of the others. So intent were they at their own peculiar work. You definitely wouldn't want to go down there. It goes down about 40 feet or so. So that's going to kind of wrap it up for this video. I'm really glad I found that old newspaper article because we were pretty perplexed when we were looking at some of the things at this old mill site. Things that I normally don't see at mills around here. That rock line trench uh, with the bricks in it, that was evidently something to do with their roaster and dryer setup they had for that silver ore. If you look at this picture out here on this knob, there was a smokestack out there. I'm not exactly sure how this all operated. If any of you have any ideas, leave it in the comments below. I'd love to hear how this thing actually um, operated with this, this setup. I mean, we've got kind of a general idea from that old newspaper article. Thanks for watching. And if you want to hang around for just a couple more minutes, there's another small mine we stopped at uh, after we visited this one. It's over in the wilderness area now. And I've always seen it on a map and I've been curious about it. So we went over and took a look at it. I was hoping we'd find more than what we did, but what little there was, I documented on video. So if you want to see that, just keep watching and it'll be next. Thanks for watching and I'll see you guys on the next video.
Ophir mine. Quite a bit of waste rock. It's like they use strap steel too. Yep. Yep. Uh oh, I see water. Eh, that'd, that'd be really surprising if it is. If it is open, it's probably chest high of water. Yeah, from down there, it looked like that was a opening that yeah, it's gonna be, say, I'd be really surprised if that was open the way the hillside looks.